So long before this podcast was even in existence or anything, Lori McKenna is just one of those people that I've always thought I would love to get to spend time with her. Just from getting to see you at Songwriter Nights, kind of becoming obsessed with your music several years ago. Um, And then I don't know if you remember this, but when I finally met you at opening weekend of the Thomas Rhett Tour, Connor was opening up. And when I met you, it was like I knew you. I gave you the biggest, most awkward bear hug ever. Do you remember that? I don't remember being awkward. Was it awkward? I probably made it awkward. That was probably my no. fault. <laughs> no, it was definitely all me because I was kind of walking by and not realizing who Connor and TR were talking to mm-hmm. backstage at Guilford. And Connor goes, Mom, this is Lori McKenna. And I was like, oh. <gasps> And just came over and immediately hugged you. So well, it was, I was just... nice. I loved it. It was, <laughs> it was good energy. It was good energy. Yeah. So one of the things that um, I love about your story, and we're going to go kind of backwards. Curious to know if you'd agree with me, but I feel like you have become the songwriter that if there is an artist in this business that wants to tell a story that's super special to them about their child, their parent, something like that. Or dying or getting old. Those are my special things. (laughs) Dying and getting old. All of the things that matter in life that you're just the go-to, that you've become that. Do you ever get in a room and just wish, could we just write about a truck today? Oh, my God. You know what? I do kind of panic sometimes when I'm in a room and they're like, let's just write the beach song today. And I'm like, oh, I'm not good at the beach. Um, But I do. I, I love those days because someone else will bring you know, whatever I have, whatever little I have about fun stuff in me, as far as writing, that's what I love about co-writing is we all, you know, bring those things out in one another. But I do, um, I do get that a lot. Like, oh, I saved this idea for you. And it's about <laughs> a lot. somebody dying or something. But I kind of love it. It makes me feel like, oh, I, I must have like, written something in the past that made them at least understand what I was trying to say mm-hmm. in a song. And then, you know, because I do the same thing is I, if I think of an idea... I'll think of a person sometimes that, oh, like, you know, so-and-so would be so good at helping me, you know, get this out of my... So you might save chest. an idea like that for a particular co-writer. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So you kind of get that So when people it. do that for me, I always... I do expect it to be within those parameters, but I'm mm-hmm. always, you know, thankful anyway. And a couple of the more recent songs that come to mind when thinking about that is the one that Maren Morris wrote, Hummingbird, mm-hmm. with you for her child. Yes. And then um, the Briefcase song by Walker Hayes oh. is really special. He's he's so special. I mean, I, I love both those people. Marin was like, that was a love junkie day. And she was just discovering that she was pregnant. And it was um, it was really just one of those songs that just like had to be written that day. It's like when someone in the room has something that just has to come out of them. Yeah. And they're um, they're 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 nice enough to share it with everybody because they're I'm sure there's days where somebody's like not ready for it yet but this that was a day where she was discovering what was happening and probably planning a million things in her head (laughs) and you know first pregnancy and you know first baby and all those things um and just shared it with us and so those are always the 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 greatest days briefcase I wrote with Walker Hayes was totally like all Walker like that was over zoom and that was just just me being the person on the other side saying, "Oh my God, that's great!" Or what did just what was the name of your street? Or what did it look like in the kitchen? Or what mm-hmm. you know? What would your mom do? You know, like that. It's just like somebody like helping you drive the car. Mm-hmm. He was driving the car and knew where to go. And I was just like, "Oh, look at the, you know, like look at the stop sign. Yeah, look at the yeah, yeah, yeah." Just really on on the outside of. Um, help just the person there to you know to to pick up something that you may have dropped that you didn't realize you said or mm-hmm. something like that. And um, he's he's I he's a genius, Walker. He what he does, I always get a little nervous because he his phrasing is such a huge part of the way he writes. Yes, and he will go anywhere anywhere his heart takes him he'll go all the way he's not as worried about the rhyming pattern or what the bridge is going to feel like make it work he's just going to make it work yeah and and I I'm not that um I just always want to be able to support him I love Mm -hmm. writing with artists like both of those you know examples are great examples that really know what they want to say and then you're just there you're just you know the cheerleader or the you know the friend that said, you know what you said five minutes ago? That yeah. makes sense now. And, and in like, some oh, aspects, maybe the counselor? Is that fair? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
It, you have a different hat, like each each song. Yeah. Even on the same day, like if you and I were going to write today and we were going to write three songs, each song, we, we would each wear a different hat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like the song tells you what, you know, what, that's what I love is finding my place in, in the, I used to say in the room, but <laughs> in, <laughs> in the, the room or the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it must be somewhat of an honor for people to be um, maybe particularly or extra vulnerable with you because they trust you to share these stories that maybe in another just typical music row co-write, they may not share. It sounds but, like these conversations can be somewhat intimate. I think they have to be, you know, I think that that's the... And I'm really lucky that, I mean, all my co-writers that I get to write with, that's where, what everyone's goal is, you know, is to, is to write a song that is truthful mm -hmm. to them. Because, you know, an artist has to sing the thing every night. Right. And, you know, they have to, mem they have to memorize 25 songs, you know what I mean? And, the, and every single word has to mean something for them to, to, for it to just fall out of their face, you know, like in, 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 in a in front of an audience, you know, so it has to be as, as true as it can be. And I'm really lucky that the, the, the amount of, um, truth that comes out of songs in this town is, it's really special. It is special. Yeah. It's my favorite, favorite part of it for sure. So in order to kind of figure out how you became that person that, that is so trusted and that these writers can be so vulnerable with and the magic that you make in a writing room, I think we have to know a little bit more about you as a person. And uh, there's so many different aspects. You're a mother of five, but you also grew up as one of six. Right. So family, and these are all heard in your song, the inspiration of family, your husband, your kids, um, even death. Some of those things are, mm -hmm. are from your life experiences. But tell me about Lori, like as a child, were you always creative? Were you writing a lot of poetry as a child? Oh, gosh, I wrote such bad poetry. I think there's like <laughs> boxes and boxes of, you know, my sixth grade handwriting, which isn't much different than my handwriting now. Uh, but yeah, I, I really wrote a lot of bad poetry. For a while, I thought I was going to be like a novelist when I was little. And then I realized I didn't have the attention span for that at all. And there was research involved. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think I can, I don't think I can hang this long to try to write a book. But um, two of my brothers are songwriters. So my brother Richie was like, um, just learn three chords and then you can write a song. Um, so being a songwriter or having the aspiration to be one didn't really feel that foreign to you because you had brothers in the family mm -hmm. who were writing songs. Like, are we talking about published yeah. songwriters, like had cuts? My oldest brother, Bobby, um, was an artist and had, you know, uh, uh, some stuff cut. And my brother, Richie, was more of just like, did does it because he loves it. Okay. You know, never really left the house with it. Um, just by choice, but it was just, which is a great lesson because it taught me, you know, you can still love something. You don't have to find, you know, commercial success in something that you love this much. It could just be, you know, something for yourself. Mm -hmm. But I think it was also the fact that I didn't know any other songwriters be besides my brothers. I didn't even know anyone in school, like, that was really in bands or wrote songs when they were growing up like I was. And I think that in a way that was really good for me because from like 12 to 25, I wrote all these songs that nobody ever heard. And so I didn't really learn to edit myself for, to please someone else. So if I wrote a song when I was 15, I didn't have to be like, oh, I should change these words because if my father hears it, he might be like, what is this about? And I just was, was writing just for you. totally self-centered writing yeah. for so long. It's not that like I felt lonely like about like, oh, why, you know, like nobody wants to hear my stuff. It wasn't like it wasn't that wasn't even like part of it. It was just like it was strictly something for me in a way that I didn't edit. I think if I had like someone had sent me to a songwriting class or somebody had been like, show me what you got, mm -hmm. like really young, I would have gone down a totally different road. Which probably is what leads to the fact of that your um, songwriting feels so organic and, and untouched. That's nice. I hope it, I hope it does. I have to like pull myself back there some, uh, and remind myself sometimes the, um, it isn't really like, don't like people say, I've, I've, you know, are you looking at, are you reading it or are you singing it? Like, are you looking at what's wrong or are you feeling what's wrong? Mm. Cause like, I just stare at the computer oh, sometimes wow. and, um, and that it, it, I have to remind myself, it's not, don't look at it, just feel it. And, and, um, and 
the best songs come when the melody and the words happen at the same time. Like I always say, they just like fall out of you. Right. Like my my girl crush example of that is is me saying to Hillary Lindsay, I want to write a song called Girl Crush, and literally she she sang the first four lines of that song. And that that tune, that melody stayed the same. Everything, like every single word, you wow. know. And I and I was literally sitting on the couch with her this close, and Liz Rose was right here, and. It, I, we always say, like, if we had a video of that, it would be, like, just amazing. Because she was like, do you mean like that? Like, we, and me and Liz are like, what just happened, you wow. know? But those are the best ones. And you will get a certain number of those over the years if you just, like, sit and kind of just, like, give yourself... It sounds weird, but, like, just sort of give yourself over to what's happening, you know, mm -hmm. musically. I don't know. I'm just going to mumble. I'm just going to fumble over some chords and, like, mumble nothing and then a word pops out and you're like oh I like the way the word sounds on that note and that part of the sentence how do I get there right you know and that's my favorite I love that and I think that that is such a key piece of advice because I'm sure you get asked that a lot but man file that one away where you just said don't look at it feel it yeah. like don't overthink the words but how does it make you feel or I love that advice for yeah. for songwriters there's so many um lessons that I've learned about songwriting from co-writers that work in just everything yeah. <laughs> in just, <laughs> life. just life right yeah you yeah. know I just heard this thing it was actually in a show about building homes and the woman the architect said she was a dancer before she was an architect and she said I think as humans we're all searching and my way of searching was through dance. And mm -hmm. I almost started crying when I heard her say it because it was like, oh, my way of searching is music. Yeah. And you're so lucky when you know what is your way of searching, mm -hmm. you know, like just trying to find each other and find where we meet each other and how we can, how do, how we, how will we connect, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and for uh, those of us that connect through music it's an instant, you know, like we talked about writing with Connor and like, you know, being like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Let's write a song. But it's an instant. Can, like, I know you on some level yeah, it's already. it's like speed dating or yeah. something. Like, yeah. you're just like, oh, hi. Okay, now be vulnerable with me yeah. and tell me, you know, a story that we, I mean, yeah. yeah it, but the greatest artists go, will go there, you know. Yes. And I have children, a lot of children older than Connor, but it's like <laughs> he was, you know, you know a good artist and a good writer just, you know, when they'll just sort of just give up to that vulnerability. It's awesome. Two of your five children are now pursuing writing. Is that something that you were in favor of and kind of wanted to help push them toward? Or I'm going to guess that probably happened organically too. They've been around it so much. It did in a way. My oldest, Brian, who's living here, um, he was he he came to me with me all for all the early shows I ever did because he was my kid. My three oldest were born when I started leaving the house with music. You and didn't play your first um, writer's night or bar show or whatever and to open mic until yeah. you were 28. Yeah. So you had what three, four kids by then? I had the three boys. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, and Brian was you know just always sort of adult he kind of he's like an old soul and he would come with me like I would throw Brian would <laughs> jump in the minivan you know with yeah. me and uh we'd go all over Boston to open mics and whatever I love um that. so he was just always there and my brother Richie who's such a big inspiration on me has was a, a big inspiration is a big inspiration for Brian as well mm -hmm. um I mean all my brothers my family is a big part of my career my sister is a big part of what I do but my family sort of pushed me out of the you know finally like I have a sister-in-law named Andrea and she was finally like come to this open mic and you're gonna you know get on stage and do it and I always just needed those little like somebody to push me right, right. but I was still petrified so I always brought Brian with me well that story is a little bit similar to Connor's situation of being exposed to and going with me yes um, when I was interviewing songwriters you know, full time for a weekly country music show I was hosting, but he was just so enamored with and fascinated with how things worked that there was no way for that not to impact him as a seven, eight, nine years old, totally. nine year old. And that's kind of the same with Brian being exposed mm -hmm. and more than anything, maybe realizing that he could do that for a living. Yeah. Yeah. No. And he, it's just always been part of him. And so he is, Brian's a bit of an artist. Like the, he always had bands growing up and he's very, him he's very authentic in his own being like this is 
how I want to present my music. And he would front these bands and and um, and play around Boston. And Chris, who's also here writing, is um, younger, and he would be like the drummer or he'd play the keyboard <laughs> like whatever they needed in the band chris would just do that mm-hmm. um w- you know a utility player yeah that's really and cool. um and they made a or early on they made a really good team like they made a superhuman together because brian was very artist driven and we're going down this road and chris would be that co-writer saying what do you need how can i help you i love what's that. my place here what mm-hmm. what do you need in this song oh you need me to play a baseline on the key, you know, like he would just find his spot. And, um, but I didn't know he was going to want to write and move here. He m- lived in LA for a while and then, um, and then moved back home and then, um, came here to write. And he, they're both just, you know, doing such a good job. It's so fun to watch. I love having adult children, first of all, because <laughs> I love talking about music with them and what they love mm-hmm. and the co writers that they meet. And, um, I actually wrote with Brian last night and it was just like, I called my husband this morning. I'm like, we had such a great, you know, it was like, it was a little bit of a challenging song too. And we like tackled it, you know, like we did it. Yes. Yeah, so you, you felt know? accomplished. Yeah. yeah we so you have to make it. an appointment to write with your, I know I mean, somebody's a publisher somewhere <laughs> setting up. Okay. We're going to put you with this writer. It happens to be Brian or Chris McKinnon. <laughs> yeah. I literally had a delivery at the condo that I had to wait for. So I'm like, Brian, what are you doing? I have to stay at the condo. And wait for it <laughs> just come here. I just love that. Come here. So, so your, your that. journey has been a little bit different because I think most people, I think that's very fair to say that want to pursue songwriting or an artist career. I've got to get to Nashville. I've got to get to Nashville. Mm-hmm. I have to live there. I have to immerse myself into the culture of what yeah. it means to be an artist or writer in Nashville. How in the world have you made this work for you and keeping you've kept your family in Boston. I know it's been a lot of commuting, Mm -hmm. but can you tell me about that decision-making process? Surely there was a time where you and your husband had to say, do we need to move to Nashville? Yeah, I've been, I think the easy answer is I've just been really lucky. So I got my deal um, because of Mary Gaucher, who gave my record to Melanie Howard, who's a publisher in town. And then she was like, can I play your songs around town? I had been here once. Um, and I was like, yeah, I would love that. I don't know how that works. Like, (laughs) and I didn't know anybody in Boston that had a publishing deal. And, um, my first cuts were the Faith Hill cuts. So I had a publishing deal since that moment, which was like 2004. I think I got my publishing deal. And And didn't you get like four cuts on that first project or three or four? Yeah. There's three on the record. And then there was like a bonus track. Uh, was Amazing. Back in the bonus track days. But yeah, um, and my son David was born that year, um, and he's 18, you know, and so it was like this, like a lot of juggling, but it, and then I made a record for Warner Brothers, we called it Warner Brothers at the time, Warner, and, um, <laughs> and I just went back and forth, but it worked because A, my family, like I said, is amazing and everybody helps me out. Um, it worked in the way that, um, I kind of needed the break of being home and not, I think if I moved here, if I just like picked up the family and we all moved here, mm-hmm. um, it would have been me wanting to write too much. Cause there's a thing about this town, this, this energy in this town where you go and get coffee and you're standing behind, you know, Tony Lane or somebody <laughs> and you're like, well, what are you doing today? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to write a song. Uh, and I think I would overwrite. And I think I would have, I wouldn't have been able to stop myself from loving songwriting so much that I probably would have like run myself on the ground with it along with raising, you know, the kids were all little, right? um, There was never any pressure though from your publisher or from Warner or about, you know, we want to sign you to this deal, but you're going to need to be here in order to write as much as we need you to. No, I was really lucky because Melanie Howard signed me for publishing and she knew that that was the deal. You know, like I was only going to be here one trip a month at that time. Mm-hmm. And so every time they represented me somewhere, um, it was like, you have her for three days if, if this is what you want. And the, and I really wasn't I really wasn't pressured. Um, a lot of people come to you too, don't they? Or have over the years? Yeah, now, especially, okay. you know, over the years. It, that didn't happen that much back then because nobody really knew who I was. You know, <laughs> I'd never co-written a song. Wow. I didn't know how to, co- I learned to co-write, you know, from Liz Rose and, and Mark D. Sanders and people like that, that 
that Melanie put me with when I first got that deal. I didn't even know like what that looked like. I think I had co-written one song with a, an artist named Josh Ritter up in Boston that's a friend of mine. And it was like, oh, this is a whole other thing. This is a whole new world. But I had a couple of, I'm thankful I had a couple of just, I, I'm not going to make my, I'm not going to lift my family up from their roots here and drag them to Tennessee and not know what is in the cards. Mm. And like, I'm not, I'm not going to make anyone else suffer <laughs> for my art. <laughs> you know, that's my job. It's not their job. So that was like the deal. And, and of course I had to travel. So there was me being away from them, but I really, I say to this all the time that I know I said no to a lot of things, but I don't remember what any of them are. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't like regret saying no to anything because I don't, it's like, it just passed, you know? Right. And it may have seemed like a really big deal at the time, but yeah. to be able to say that these years later that you really don't even remember. It doesn't what matter. You, yeah. That's awesome. What it was. Like it might, it may have been a, it would have been a very different road if we, if we did that or if I took that tour or if I, you know, um, but the road that I'm on is perfect. So yeah, I'm happy with it. That's so awesome. And um, I, mentioned this in the intro, but I just feel like if, if you want to, if you're a mom or a wife or just even, you know, your, your family matters to you just, and you want to get in your feels, ask Alexa to shuffle Lori McKenna songs <laughs> <laughs> because that will Does do that it for work? you every time it works. Yes. <laughs> and if you do that, it actually plays not just your songs that you've recorded on your projects, but also songs you've written for other people. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. So it's really neat. And then it kind of really gives, you know, someone like me just the perspective of the depth of your writing and the songs and, and the relatability too is, nice. is I think really there particularly for um, a mom, oh, you know, good. which is, a, which is a lot of our audience. So I love that. And um, rumor has it though, you actually have a place in Nashville now. We do. So you're here so much, I guess. That yeah. We bought a little condo and it's been great. It's, um, you know, it's, it, I'm a home body I'm a homemaker like I like to clean things <laughs> which you kind of maybe never know if you looked at my house but I do like to clean things I like to nest and so uh, my manager Beth Laird a few I guess like four years ago was like you know right before COVID actually she was like you should just rather than I used to always stay with Liz Rose oh, you and did? Then she was building she's like been in like four houses since I've <laughs> known her and she's always building a new house or something and so she was going through construction so I was staying in a hotel each time I would come and and Beth was like, you should just buy something. You can sell it, you know, like in a few years. Just like look for a condo and buy it and then save all, all these hotel fees. And what I realized once we got it was I it's really part of my process mm. is like getting up and having my routine and cleaning something and doing laundry. <laughs> it's really a home base. Yeah. Makes you feel like when you're at home. I re yeah. It really helps. I think like when I'm home writing alone, I sit in the in the dining room and I literally I do the laundry. I like get I take the dogs out like I'm constantly like you, like any like person that's yeah, home yeah is get five projects going on multitasking and it sort of helps my brain like I'll find the line when I'm folding laundry or you know picking up laundry oh wow or, right, well I've got some if you need just some extra inspiration yeah. you can you can't really help. do that when you're co-writing you're like I'm gonna just get up and do some laundry now do you have a basket of laundry I could fold while we consider this next line but I do like that process you I know that. I think it helps me you have mentioned the love junkies a couple of times for mm -hmm. people who aren't familiar with tell me kind of how you guys became the Love Junkies and about that relationship. So the Love Junkies is myself and Hillary Lindsay and Liz Rose. And at that time, I was coming to town um, twice a month, staying with Liz. She was in a, when we first started, she was in a condo, um, this beautiful condo that she had. And I would just stay there for three days. You know, I would come in like I do now, like I come in first thing Monday morning, I leave Wednesday night. And I would stay with her. And the publishers, our three publishers decided, well, if Laura's just going to be with Liz for three days, why doesn't Hillary just join for three days? And and she didn't, Hillary didn't have her daughter yet. She wasn't born yet. So Hillary was like, well, I'll sleep over too. <laughs> and um, I had written with Hillary once and Liz had written with Hillary once. And they had a Taylor Swift cut. They wrote Fearless. I think it was Fearless with together with Taylor. And um, But we didn't, all the three of us didn't know each other that well yet and we just fell into like we're all about eight years apart we were all in like very different 
like areas of our lives. We still are. And all of our weaknesses fed each other's strengths and all of our strengths fed each other's weaknesses. Like we all, we just fell in line together. An ideal situation for writing. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Different life experiences. And just for womanhood, for friendship. And, um, and we, it's been, um, the first song we wrote together was Sober, which was cut by Little Big Town. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to find a rhyme that, I don't even know what the line was, but that's where Love Junkie came from. And somebody said, like, we should name ourselves, you know, we should name our right, you know, because we like instantly fell in love. We're like, we're, we should name our, our little team here. Isn't that crazy how it's yeah. just totally it was a become joke. a thing yeah. too, though? Because, <laughs> you know, I think even when I was talking to um, our friend Shana, who helped set this up, and she's like, yeah, she has a Love Junkies day that day. So mm-hmm. we'll schedule yeah. it around that. But it's like a thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like the rule is like nobody gets in nobody gets out like we stay but we we hunker down together and we write from the minute we wake up in the morning until why well, I would say Liz goes to sleep but when somebody falls asleep it's changed over the evolved over the years but the friendship has not you know mm-hmm. Hillary has a mm-hmm. has a little girl now that she has to bring to school and put to bed and all those things um but the the friendship has not we literally um you know over lockdown and COVID and everything, we would get on the phone and just like three, three hours be on the phone, just talking. Like sometimes when we get together, it's like, I don't even care if we write a song. I just need to sit in your space and just sit with you and be able to say anything. Because of how deep that friendship's grown. Yeah. That's really neat. And it wouldn't have, you know, as, as an, as a, uh, as an adult, it's harder to find friends like that as you get older. But the music, again, it's like that's the touch point. That's the connection. That's the piece. And we all know how to go right there. We know how to just be ourselves with one another because of this great job we get to have. And um, and so it, just, it was just like a perfect combina- combination. So I think this is a Love Junkie song, but um, I have to say what kind of my favorite. I think it changes sometimes, but my favorite um, Lori McKenna song. But right now it is... Um, when you're my age. Can you just tell me a little bit more about that song since I just love it so much? Oh, thank you. That is a Love Junkie song. And that song came from, um, I have to think about it. I think it was David Letterman interviewing Howard Stern. He has a show called My Next Guest. Okay, wait. Howard Stern inspired When You're My Age? Well, David Letterman did. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I think it's the Howard Stern. He's interviewing Howard Stern. But he has a that show, um, My Next Guest Needs No Extra. Yes, it's so good. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's Howard Stern, but I might be wrong. Um, it might be Seinfeld or something. But, so, but it's David Letterman, and he's talking about the world. He's talking, he's getting political a little bit and he's talking about the world. And he said, my son's 14 years old. What's the world going to be like when he's my age? And it just like hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, oh my God, when you're my age, like, you know, and that's all I had. And so I was home at the time and I wrote the first verse and the last verse of that song. And, um, when you're my age, you know, I hope the world is kinder like the verse. And I couldn't figure out where else to go or how else to get back. Like I was stuck and I tried so hard. I tried so hard by myself to write that song. Uh, it was, I wrote it on piano, which I can't really play. Um, <laughs> but I tried it on, I tried it on everything and I, it, over a month. And then I had a love junkie day and it was, um, I remember Little Big Town, who's such a big part of Love Junkies' lives. Mm-hmm. Like we, we we love them so much. Um, they were they had an exhibit that was opening at the Country Music Hall of Fame, and they opened it up to friends and family like the night before its official opening. And we were going to see that at like five o'clock or something. So we wrote earlier in the day, and then we had like this hour where we're like, we can hang out and talk about our husbands. <laughs> Or we can take a nap or we can like, you know, Work. pick at a song. And I was like, hey, I have these two verses. Can you just listen to it and see? And I played the first verse. And Liz, I remember looking over at Hillary and she looked at Liz and she goes, how do you know what she's singing? Because Liz started singing along with me, first of all. And Hillary was like. And had never heard it. Had never heard it. And 
she looked at, I remember kind of catching her out of the corner of her eye, my eye. And Hillary was like, how do you know what she's saying? She goes, I know her. I know what she's saying. I know. Like, she knows you so know, well she that she knew heart. where you were headed. She's like, I know what she's going to She's going to say backyard now. And so like, she's like, she starts kind of singing along, which is like remarkable in itself. And, um, and Hillary's like, no. No, no, no. We are not helping you with that song. That is your song. Like, I'm not touching it with it. Don't, I don't even want to hear any more of it. You just go home and finish that song. And Liz just keeps singing. And she started singing the chorus. You'll outgrow your shoes. You'll outgrow your bed. She had, she had just had, her grandson was like, her grandson Jack was like two years old at the time. So she has a grandbaby. Hillary has a baby baby. I have five babies all over the place. Like we have all these different, we're in all these different spaces as moms. And um, she starts, Liz starts singing the chorus. And uh, the outgrow and all these things. And we still don't know how to get back. And Hillary is just mad at this point because she's she did not want to help. She just wanted me to do it. Myself. Because she felt like it was so special. And, yeah. And um and she and I'm like, I just don't know how to get back. I just don't know what to do. Like what's the hook of this song? And it never occurred to me that the hook would be when you're my age. And Hillary said, Well this is dumb, but you could say and she did the whole hook with, you know, you know, you always be my baby, even when you're my age. And we the last two lines. All yes, and we the three of us just as soon as it came out of her mouth, it was one of those moments where you could see a thought that someone has, and it's a good thought. This is what happens in songwriting. You think it's a good thought, and you just pray that by the time it gets out of your mouth, it made it like connected and made sense. Right. By the time it gets out. Because a lot of times you think it's a good thought, and by the time your mouth says it, wait a minute, I'm sorry, that didn't work. <laughs> but this was a moment where we we could, Liz and I saw it happen with her. She was like, this isn't going to be good. And when it came out, it was magic. It was perfect. But there was so much, that I love that song so much for the three of us because all like that's I could not have done that without Liz being just a genius and knowing exactly what I wanted like knowing more than I did what right. I needed and then Hillary reluctantly reluctantly <laughs> saving it all yeah, you know kind of tying it up with and the then bow. we all just cried we literally just cried oh wow and um I like the story because of how it sounds like each of their life experiences yeah. and yours kind of all combined together and what that song ended up being yeah yeah and it needed all it needed three moms in three different you know, life situations. Yeah. And stages of, yeah. of life. Yeah. That's so neat. Tell me a couple of lines from any of your songs that are the most real when it comes to your kids. Like oh, there's, yeah. I hear sneaking out a window. I hear like, are there, are there some lines in there that, that you've lived as a mom? We get a lot of that sneaking out windows. Um, <laughs> my favorite story about that, that I can think of at this very moment. In Humble and Kind, there's a thing about, uh, there's a difference between sleeping with somebody and sleeping with someone you love. Um, literally came from um, one of my kids. I won't tell you which one, but literally, I was, I was like, one of those. <laughs> it was one of those early morning flights, and David, my youngest, was still quite young. And I was like sneaking into down in the basement where the playroom is and the great room is. And there's a refrigerator down there with like the juice boxes at the time. And I was like sneaking down to go get those to leave on the counter before I left for a trip. And one of my kids that didn't even live with me is like on the couch with some woman that I've never seen before. <laughs> It was like four in the morning and I was like, who are those people? And then I got to the airport and called my husband. I'm like, there's like kids in the basement and there's a girl there, a woman that I've never seen before. They're together on a couch. And that's where kind of that came from. And because, because that, you know, it was, the story goes that, you know, my husband got up and was like, you better get out of here before the little kids come down. <laughs> <laughs> super super smart but, okay now we get to the real story behind humble and kind I because know, most right? of the time when I've heard you share you know about that have been how you you know were just doing this beautiful mother thing of sitting <laughs> in a chair and writing down all the things that you wish your kids mm -hmm. have known but now we know that one was that a little line. bit of a okay you don't even live here anymore <laughs> I can only imagine the I haven't met your friend yet so out you go but um <laughs> That song, I did want to make sure I had something for each of the kids. And there's so much of, you know, 
hold the door, say please, say thank you, because David was only 10. My youngest right. was 10 at the time. And there's so much of that. Like, how many times do we say that to the, to our kids? Yeah. And that, the, the, the repetitiveness of that. And the, the, I needed it to be like really simple and just, you know, basic in some lines. And I wanted it to be really like older in other lines. To um, where you could kind of, the lines would apply to any of the kids, yeah. even though this, the span was probably what, 10 to 20 yeah. something at the time. Yeah. Right? There's 15 years between my oldest and my youngest. Okay. So, okay. but that was a line that McGraw said, said like sort of was like, okay, I'm going to cut this off. Did he change anything in that song? No, he didn't. In fact, I changed something in that song after he cut it. Because I made a work tape the day I wrote it, I I made I just sang it in my phone and okay the version on your album yeah it's I, a little bit different isn't it because I had trouble with the phrasing and uh, the the last line is it, uh, when you get where you're going um, I originally said don't forget you know turn around and help the the next one in line yes and when I went to cut the song I couldn't I just stumbled over the phrasing of it and um, and I. I took out the don't forget part. Um, okay. And I, I do get in trouble with that sometimes because if I'm singing it for an audience that knows, thankfully, most of the audiences know. At my shows, they know my version of it along with Tim's. But if I'm opening for Miranda or somebody mm-hmm. the, and the audience sings back, which is like this incredible moment for any singer. Yeah. They, I have to remember that they know Tim's version. <laughs> that they're going to see, they're going to add that part. Yeah. That's the original work tape. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and by the time I, I cut it up like a year after he did, or a few months after he did okay. and sort of stumbled over it. I love how you casually like, you know, if I'm opening for Miranda Lambert or something, well, like, I mean, you had some incredible opportunities I beyond have. and there's the so success much as luck. a songwriter. I, yeah. I hope I said that clearly earlier. Like I've just been like, so and like just incredibly lucky and I always met the luck with work I, I will do the work yes and, and but I love what I do I'm lucky and I'm willing to work for it and when you put those things together you're gonna you know just be able to look back on a career that was you know a, a blessing you know especially in music it's so fun <laughs> 